Well, good morning and a very warm welcome. It's fantastic to have you with us, wherever you're coming from, however you're feeling this morning. And with that blink of sunshine, I'm afraid I'd take my jacket off. I just got so excited we're at that point in the year where things are flourishing and I hope that you are too. You're welcome to join with us. I'm, dis- I'm disoriented here this morning because Martin's sitting over here. So um, if, if I'm suddenly a bit confused, you know it's Martin that has undermined my confidence this morning, but bless him. Thank you. Thank you for that. As you will see, there's lots of things happening um, in Pennycook Trinity Community Church. Um, notices are on the sheet, but there are one or two that I want to highlight as well as that, because there's more than that that's simply going on. Um, we are on a journey as a church, because we are... Church is coming together um, and looking to express our life in new ways. Yesterday we had a meeting um, and thinking about uh, how that expression is going to work. And we we're talking about parent and toddler groups, thinking about redesigning the inside of the building, thinking about getting to know each other better, schools, a whole lot of things we were talking about. And we would continue to value your input and your questions as we journey together towards being a missional church, a pastorally attentive church, and a multi-generational church. This isn't going to be a journey that happens overnight. And so we need all of us to be asking questions, to be saying what's happening with this, what about that? We all have gifts. We were saying yesterday, just to Scots, how often we deny that, oh, go away, I don't have any gifts, you know. I do a wee bit of shopping now and again, but I'm in the house most of the time. Actually, you can be well connected. You're, I know that many of you are prayerful people. You notice things. You love nature. There's a whole host of gifts that we have in our community. So as we're journeying together, please, um, you will be asked um, about what might be possible for you. Or please come and speak to John or even myself about what you feel called to and, and what you're about. One of the things that we're asking your thoughts on is the logo for Pennycook Trinity Community Church. What should that look like as we come together? Something eye-catching? Something that captures Trinity and community? How do we do that well? Please, if you have a wee scribble, do it at lunchtime, you know, um, or afterwards, or or when you're still here, in fact. Maybe we should do that one Sunday, John. Just wait behind. You won't get to leave until you do a wee doodle. And of course you go, ach, I'm rubbish at art. Hey, I got a band eight when I was at school. The worst you could get was a band ten. And I remember being asked to draw your shoe. I simply drew around the the, the sole of my shoe. Anyway, (laughs) a logo. Could you help us with a logo for this new church? Do it now. Do it during the service. Is that okay, John? Anyway, do it during, whatever. (laughs) Tomorrow at half past seven, uh, in here, no, at the hall next door, we have the ecumenical monthly prayer meeting. That's at half past seven tomorrow evening. Tomorrow at half past seven, Martin. But tonight we're also praying um, in the hall as our weekly prayer time together. On May the 15th, we are remembering specifically Christian Aid Sunday. And so we are making, uh, things will be made. And if you want to make some things, see Janice Hogg about this. We'll be collecting, uh, paying for our teas and coffees and tray bakes. Um, So don't have too big a breakfast and come and enjoy something on May the 15th. Um, Also, um, didn't make the notices, but one way of of thinking about Ukraine at the moment is could we as a church help host a family? That's a big ask, but maybe we could do it together as a church. If you're interested, have a chat with me and we'll see see what we together might manage to do. I wonder what makes you happy. I wonder when you feel God's blessing. And you'd say, I feel blessed when. How would you answer that question? One of the blessings that we've had is to know Maisie, Bruce, who has died just this couple of days ago. And so we give thanks to God. Shall we just give thanks to God for the blessing that Maisie's been to many people? Um, and pray for Bill at this time. Shall we, shall we just hold silence?
We thank you, Lord, for Maisie Bruce, for her faithfulness, for her love. And we pray for Bill at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand as we say together our opening responses? If you could say the words that are in bold. God is here. Come with hope or with hesitation, with joy or with sorrow, thankful or empty. Come all who hunger, all who thirst for the fullness of life. We open ourselves and listen to our soul's longing. We open ourselves to meeting Jesus, the healer, our brother. We come to rekindle the life of the spirit deep within. As we gather here to worship, so we invite God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to meet with us. God is here. Let's pray together. And in the quiet, we listen to our hearts. We have already affirmed that God is here. And we come here this morning to open ourselves to God speaking to us in our deepest places. So we let go of trying to be somebody that we're not. And we come as we are. This morning, can I ask you, what is it that you want to thank God for? God, how simple things such as sunshine can lift our spirits. And yet behind this, we come because we believe that you are the creator of all things. And so we praise you for this beautiful world in which you've made. We acknowledge that we too are part of your beautiful creation. And we thank you for one another, for all that you give us, for all that you give us. Forgive us when we live presumptuously. We live as if these lives are our own and we forget that they're a gift from you. God, as we gather, we ask you'd help us reflect on our lives and that truly our lives would be centered on Christ the source of love and life and hope. And we pray that all we talk about today and in this place relates to all aspects of our lives. And so God, we're coming looking for your direction and your encouragement and your help. Help when in our lives we do things that contradict the, the deepest desires of our hearts when we're tempted to buy things that we don't really need when we can overeat when we buy things that we'll never use when we think ourselves more important than we are Lord save us and have mercy upon us God, we thank you that you love us so much. You didn't send anybody else, but you came yourself in Jesus to live amongst us. In Jesus, you spoke with the ignored and you healed the untouchable. You loved the unlovely and you ate with ordinary folks. In Jesus, we see that your love was stronger than death. And in this season of resurrection, we praise and thank you for the power of that love. 
The power of that love that gives us hope. We're not simply part of a club, but you have called each one of us to relate to you because of that love of Jesus. And that opens us to new ways of being, new ways of seeing, new ways of thinking. So as we gather here this morning, Holy Spirit, in your mystery and grace, Affirm who we are in Jesus. Help us to see afresh your blessings and your way. That we might truly be your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And where are you? Could you come out and join me? Take the lectern, please. Now, Anne, you're going to tell us about an experience you had of an Alpha course, because we're running an Alpha course starting this Wednesday at 10. Mm -hmm. So just tell us in your own words how this happened. Well, I happened to see the sign one day when I was, I think I was at this church, and wondered what it was all about exploring Christianity um, myself I've always had or felt Jesus in my life from very young we were taught to say our prayers going to bed I got my first big bible at five years old and I've just always felt Jesus present with me and I was keen to when I saw that sign I thought I was so drawn to it I'm going to see what happens here and I'm so glad I did it was such a wonderful experience meeting new people just learning about Jesus and what he'd done for us that was a 10 week course and it was absolutely wonderful the first one that I did go on and thinking of Maisie Maisie was in our group Bill and Maisie and we've gone for years in our Bible study group together, mm -hmm. learned from each other, and it was just so exciting that I wanted to do another Alpha, which I did do. I went, it was at St. James the Less Hall, many years ago, I may add, when I think about it, counting back. <laughs> uh, and that experience was week five, watching the video. And Nicky Gumbel talked about faith coming alive. And those two words, as if he had taken them in his hand and thrown them at me. My heart leapt, and I wanted to shout, that's what was happening to me. And from there on, God has just brought my faith alive. Helped me to do things I couldn't do on my own. Things I wouldn't do on my own. Standing up here, for instance, no way. <laughs> But it's just always been there for me and just guided me through. I started when we had our started. We didn't want to finish the the Bible, the Alpha course, uh -huh. so we had a Bible study group, and it was there I went to or started to read my Bible every day, which I have done every day since. And uh -huh. He speaks to me through His Word okay. and has comforted me. Yes. And I advise anybody who wants to. Come to an Alpha, please come to an Alpha because they're absolutely wonderful. What when more Jesus can I say? And your life is just brilliant. What more can we say? I thank God that you've had the opportunity to say this out to everyone. And thank you very much. Let's give. I want to thank the church family because they're such a support. And here it's just wonderful. I feel it's so exciting. Okay. So thank you. Okay. I want to take you back years ago to when I was uh, an assistant minister. I hadn't been properly ordained yet, and I was with John Young. You remember he spoke at the service uh, several weeks ago. And one thing about John Young's manse, he has a room in it with big picture windows. 
and I used to have lunch with him sometimes in that room. And the manse outside has a large, a large garden. And John used to say to people that you get a, a lovely clear view when the sun was shining on the garden and everything looked beautiful. However, sometimes the sun wasn't shining on the garden, it was shining on the window instead. And then it was a different story because all the flaws and blemishes, all the places that had got dirty or dull or damaged showed up in the light that streamed in. It's the same with our lives, John used to say. When the focus is on something else, everything can seem fine. But when God's light starts to shine on us, the true story becomes apparent. We see that everything's not fine. There are flaws and blemishes. Parts of our lives are polluted or dull or damaged. And the light begins to show that. And that's true for all of us. What's important is what we then do. A window you can more or less clean up if you've got time and patience and the right cleaning materials. And you can access both sides of the glass. A life isn't so easy. You might be able to polish it a bit on the outside, but if the marks are on the inside, then all the outside polishing doesn't make all that much of a difference. What does it take to clean up a life on the inside? Now in Jesus' day, a large number of people were looking for the kingdom of God to happen. The time when God would begin to clean up all the things that went wrong in his world, all the things that weren't right. And what what sort of people would be in the position to be blessed, to become part of the kingdom of God. Jesus begins to address that question in the Beatitudes. And the first of these that we're looking at today is blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed, how blessed are those who are spiritually poor for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Our first reading is Matthew chapter 5 and verses 1 to 10. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Our second reading this morning is taken from James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. My brothers and sisters, believers in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not now show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet. 
Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he said, you shall not commit adultery. Also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would send your spirit on me as I begin to speak and on all of us as we listen and think about these things and think about the meaning in our own personal lives. Father, you sent Jesus and in his name we pray to you. Amen. In Matthew's account of Jesus' life, the message that Jesus proclaimed is summarized in this way. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. In other words, the kingdom of God has come near. Jesus then calls disciples from their normal occupations and their family lives to become his apprentices, his pupils. And he says to them, follow me. And as he goes around preaching and healing, his fame spreads and crowds also follow him, respectfully perhaps, out of curiosity or wonder perhaps not as intentionally or sacrificially as the disciples, they're maybe fearful of commitment. They've maybe got great need. And they're listening from the outside. We're told when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain and after he sat down, that's the normal teaching position in the ancient world, if I were teaching you in an ancient church or in an ancient situation, I would be sitting down, but I'm going to stand up today. And then his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, and it's teaching that appears to be directed to the disciples, but by the end of this block of teaching in chapter 7, the crowds appear to be listening as well. And it's a call, all of it, to a radical new way of life, which as one writer says, he says, grace and demand are linked inextricably. Grace, God's generosity, God's demands are linked inextricably. And he goes on to say that Jesus' demanding teaching is to be central both in the life of the community, in the life of the church, and in its discipling of the nations. Today we're going to look at how this section begins. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now we call this start of the first section the Beatitudes, that just simply mean the blessed, the blessed. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Let's look at some possible interpretations. It could mean spiritually impoverished, 
That means when we come to God, we can only plead for his kindness, his mercy and grace. Because we've no other reason to be accepted. We're so imperfect in ourselves. Poor in spirit could mean discouraged. We're so ground down by life that we find ourselves ready to approach God. That's possibly what people were like in Jesus' day. And yes, it's, it's only when people sometimes hit rock bottom that they begin to look for God. And some people think it means actual financial poverty. Though I don't think it's only people in actual poverty that God is really ready to help. Even if sometimes actual financial poverty can make people more aware of their dependence on God. To be honest, if we look at the Old Testament scripture, that's the way the concept developed. The word poor moved in the Old Testament from describing outward material distress to also describing those who put their complete trust in God because they had no other hope. If you want an example, go to Psalm 34. And in it, a poor man is described who cried out to God and was heard. In our reading today from the letter of James, there's a description of the rich and the poor. And James is addressing both. And you see the, the straightforward, the literal meaning of that term, rich and poor. And the more figurative senses, the more metaphorical senses of the words rich and poor intertwining with each other. Listen if you can see Jesus' beatitude in the background. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and inherit the kingdom that he promised to those who love him. But neither Jesus nor James say that only poor people can enter the kingdom. Nor does Jesus say that the rich cannot enter the kingdom, but both have serious warnings about the barrier that riches can be. Riches can stop people coming to God, coming to Jesus. Stop them entering the kingdom of God. They often don't see the need or they turn back. Think of the rich young ruler in the gospel who turns back because he's very sad and he doesn't want to make the sacrifices that following Jesus can mean. Matthew presents Jesus as speaking of the poor in spirit. And there are plenty of passages in scripture that speak of real poverty, but this isn't one of them. We can speak of the passages maybe of another time. It's the people who know that they desperately need God and his grace who are the spiritually poor. Jesus is here giving the key to the rest of his teaching about becoming part of God's kingdom, experiencing God's kingly rule in our lives. This is the only basis for relating to God, to realize that we badly need God and to admit that to God and ourselves. Being humble is not just pretending that you don't have any gifts. It's being honest with God about the reality in your lives. And if we're honest, this can upset us a bit 
we like to think that we're not doing too badly, that we might not be among the very best, but we're, we're not among the worst either. We live in a society which is full of self-help books and positive psychological reinforcement to convince us that we're okay, or at least on the road to becoming okay. And the thought that we might fundamentally need help can be disturbing or unwelcome to us. And yet we all recognize that admitting you need help when you have a serious problem is an important first step. We just don't want to think that all of us might have a serious problem and one that only God can deal with, especially if the serious problem has an old-fashioned and rather embarrassing name, sin. Or even if we do admit we have a problem, we might feel we've taken steps to deal with it in our own way, to, that we have it under control. But Jesus' teaching is that we can't come to God saying, we've dealt with this all by ourselves. It's the poor in spirit, the ones who admit their need to whom the kingdom of God belongs. Now, if you're confused about the kingdom of heaven in Matthew's gospel, the kingdom of heaven is just another way of saying the kingdom of God. You know how many Jewish people avoid using God's name if they can. Well, that was what Matthew was doing as well. Now, it's easier for some people to blank all this out than for others to do so. The street girls and the get rich quick tax farmers responded to what John the Baptist and to Jesus, to what they were, he was saying to them, because they knew that their lives were in a mess. And many of those who were intent on purifying Israel through strict adherence to the law didn't respond or responded only in anger because they couldn't see the depth of their own need. And it's not just the Pharisees. It's also churches who can fall into this trap of thinking that all is fine. And it's to that kind of situation that the letter to the Christian church at Laodicea in Revelation chapter 2 is directed. Jesus says to his church, you say I'm rich. I've acquired wealth and I don't need a thing. But you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. However much we know of what kind of lives God wants us to lead, however much God's light shines on us, we still need the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and begin to make a difference. And also we need the forgiveness of sins that's freely available in Jesus. Not so we can just relax back into our old way of life, but so we can begin a new way of living or rebegin a new way under Jesus' Lordship. Now I've kept you for quite some time. Let's just, as it were, give you a few post-it notes 
Paul in the third chapter of Romans says that there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. People who know what kind of life God wants them, God wants for them and they they seek to obey it. And people like the Gentiles who, who muddle along not exactly knowing what the right way is. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what the true standard is. All that God is. The glory of God. What he wants our lives to reflect. And there's just one way for both sorts of people to be accepted by God. In one translation it puts it this, thus. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Or another translation puts it, the free gift of God's grace makes us right with God. Christ Jesus paid the price to set us free. He paid the price on the cross for us. And then when we acknowledge that, when we turn to God, then God begins to work in us by the Holy Spirit. And as we respond to God's work in us, we begin to grow in the way of life that God wants us to live. But it's only those who first admit their need to God and ask for what God freely offers to us who experience this. Let's pray. We use the words of a traditional prayer to pray. Almighty God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace and in the renewal of our lives make known your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We choose to rejoice that God is faithful today and we join with ancient praise of all God's people in a verse from Psalm 18. You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we ask you to hear our prayers today for our church, for your church, the world, our local community and people in need. Loving God, we pray for Pennycook Trinity Community Church. We thank you that for your blessings on us as we come together from two former church families. We ask that you continue to guide those who lead us and for each one of us as congregation members to seek to do your will in our local community. In a moment of silence, please ask God to show each of us the part he wants us to play in church life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, as we pray for your world, we ask that you take from us all hatred and prejudice. Give us your spirit of love for all people, whatever their race or creed, and show us what we can do to look after your world. We continue to pray for all those affected by the COVID pandemic over the last two years. Father, we lift up nations at war. We pray for all who have lost loved ones there, who have been forced to leave their homes, and for people who continue to live in fear of the atrocities of war. 
We ask you to give strength and courage to the leaders of all nations involved to make good decisions to benefit the people in their countries. Father, we lift up peacemakers and diplomats working tirelessly and anonymously behind the scenes to bring peace to these nations. We pray too that the evil and selfish perpetrators of crime in these countries are called out and prevented from preying on vulnerable refugees desperate to escape the troubles. Help us, Lord, to seek your will in what we can do to help our neighbours in need. Almighty God, we ask, we pray for our local community. We ask that each of us makes use of the individual talents you've provided to enable us to flourish as a witness to you. We acknowledge the difficulties people face with the rising cost of living. Comfort those who are struggling financially. Give energy and stamina to people who are working more hours to help meet financial commitments. In a moment of silence, please pray for any aspect of life in our local community that is on your heart today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, within your embrace, we find comfort and healing. We bring to you all who are struggling with their physical, mental or spiritual health. You are the great healer. And again in quietness, we pray for healing of mind and body for ourselves and those we name now in our hearts. Everlasting God, you watch over us and lead us throughout our lives. We ask you to draw close to all those who've lost a loved one, recently or around this time of year. Give them comfort, reassurance, and help them to remember that your son, Jesus Christ, put an end to death by dying for us. We remember again our dear sister, Maisie. Lord, we thank you for her for her faithful witness to your saving power over the years of her long life. Father, just be there to comfort Bill, Maureen and Stuart and their families and all the friends as they grieve. Touch them with your comfort and peace. Father God, send us out into the world renewed by your worship and strengthened by our fellowship, so that we may be a witness to the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, and bring healing and reconciliation to our wounded world. And we end with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For nine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. For all that God can do within us, for all that God can do without us. Thanks be to God. For all in whom Christ lived before us. For all in whom Christ lives beside us. Thanks be to God. For all the Spirit wants to bring us. For where the Spirit wants to send us. Thanks be to God. Christ has promised to be with us until the end of time. We go and meet him. And may the love of the Father ground your actions. May the joy of Christ shine from your face. And may the leading of the Holy Spirit lead you in new paths. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you all this day and forevermore. Amen.